Welcome everyone to our weekly webinar here at the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. I'm David Parsons, the ICEJ Vice President and Senior Spokesman coming to you from our headquarters in Jerusalem. And this is also part of week three of our month-long Envision 2022 conference. And it's great to have all the people who have registered for that with us. We're gonna give you an opportunity towards the end to ask some questions. And we wanna welcome everyone else who's joining us uh, in uh, the different formats on Zoom where you can get translation into seven other languages. Uh, let's see what we have here. Chinese, French, Russian, Portuguese, Spanish, Indonesian, Slovak, and Thai. That's eight languages uh, besides English. And we're also on Facebook Live and uh, um, uh, YouTube channel. But uh, if you're on in the Envision streaming platform, we really want to welcome you. We have a special program, uh, really a continuation of a conversation we started last week on Tuesday when we were visiting the northern border of Israel, looking over into Lebanon from the community of the kibbutz of Misgav Am. And we were joined there by uh, IDF Reserve Major Elliot Hodoff, and we're glad to have you back, Elliot. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Um, good to be back. Yeah. Now, we had a good, interesting conversation. I only had about 20 minutes as part of that program, but we've got you for an hour now, and uh, we're going to talk to you more about uh, not only the the rocket threat to Israel, especially in the north, but the overall Iranian threat, many issues we hope to be able to cover with you. Uh, Elliot Hodoff, uh, as I said, he's a um, major in the IDF reserves, still um, uh, part of the IDF Home Front Command in the northern region of Israel, very important position. He served 35 years in the IDF and wrote their operational manual, so a very important position. And uh, he's been uh, uh, an advisor on military uh, security issues and counterterrorism, both to uh, the Israeli government and to the U.S. Uh, different agencies in the U.S. government and uh, other uh, global companies and such one of Israel's real security experts, and we're, we're really pleased to have him. Elliot, last week, we started out uh, talking about the Israeli study, a uh, recent government study that said there's a, a dire lack of adequate bomb shelters, sufficient shelters in the northern part of Israel. You explained a little how um, this uh, was, uh, there were community shelters built in the early decades of Israel, but in, uh, a lot of old construction do not have shelters in the homes because you only got a few seconds sometimes. It's not adequate, and there's, uh, especially within 10, 15 miles of the border, around 250,000 Israelis. They're Arab and Jewish villages, and, and uh, Druze, and Christian, and Muslim, and Jewish uh, towns that all lack shelters. That's why the Christian embassy has helped put shelters in. Uh, we talked about the number. You said 250,000 rockets that Hezbollah now possesses, up to that amount, around that amount. Uh, that it doesn't really matter the exact number. It's they have a better quality, better, uh, heavier warheads, payloads, and longer range that you can sit back in Beirut and fire them. And they can hit deeper into Israel that 95% of the Israeli population, even down into the Negev, is now uh, within the range of Hezbollah rockets. And uh, we also talked about... Um, uh, an assessment of the strength of Hezbollah coming uh, the, uh, yes, please don't talk there. The strength of Hezbollah coming out of the Syrian civil war and uh, that you assessed it was uh, actually stronger, had combat, more combat experience, even though they have lost a lot of people there and had a lot of funerals there in Southern Lebanon. And uh, we asked the question, and this is part of what you're doing a doctorate on now, is you know, why you're studying Hezbollah and why is Hezbollah and Iran, why are they so bent on destroying Israel? Can you just pick up with that 
cover anything okay. from last week that you want to fill in here, and then we'll pick up the conversation again. Well, first of all, I, I think it's important. Something that you, that you said is is, um, is critically important. Hezbollah and Iran uh, are essentially one entity. And so understanding Hezbollah means understanding Iran. Um, different from Hamas. Hamas is a proxy of Iran, classical proxy. Hezbollah is actually part of the Iranian sort of hierarchy um, of the Iranian, of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, the Quds Force. Specifically to your question, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran, was a vicious exterminationist anti-Semite. And that's something, it's hard to, to, to sort of get your head around. What is an Iranian leader uh, in, at the time in, in either in Iraq or in Paris, depending at, at what stage, why is he still focused on the Jews? And the answer is that was his ideology. He, he drew it from the Nazis. He drew it from the Muslim Brotherhood, from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's ideologue, Said Qutb. And Khomeini wrote a seminal work in the uh, in the 19th, in the 60s and in, into the 70s that came out in English. It exists. Uh, I have a copy here on my shelf called Islamic Government. And what is significant to me relative to your question is that paragraph two, page one of the book Islamic Government starts with the words. The Jews have always been the enemies of Islam. Okay, by comparison, it took Hitler about 25 pages to get to the Jews in Mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. It took Khomeini one paragraph. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand how deeply rooted the Jew hatred is in Khomeini's philosophy and ideology. The second thing that's important is that in Islamic government, he came up with, with something of a revolutionary idea. And this, this is a lecture in and of itself, so I'll, I'll sort of you know, shrink it down to a, co a couple of sentences, that the leader of the Islamic Republic, himself obviously, although when he wrote the book, he wasn't yet the leader, would become the supreme spiritual political leader of all Shiites in the world, not just of Iran. And he writes, Specifically, violating the word of the jurist, that's the term that he used, fakir in, in Farsi, is the equivalent of violating the order of Allah. In other words, he, places, he placed himself in a position essentially of God's mouthpiece. Hezbollah, by its own documentation and ideology, is a firm follower of that principle. In other words, Khomeini's word is the word of God. And Khamenei, who is his successor, is the heir to that throne. So anything that comes out of Tehran, out of the supreme leader's mouth, is seen by the Islamists. Not everybody in, in Iran is an Islamist, but the leadership is, the, you know, the institutions are, and by Hezbollah as absolute divine dictate. And there's, there's no questioning of, of any of that. Trying to reason with it is pointless. So that, that's the core of it. The destruction of Israel and of the Jews, not just of Israel. Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah a few years ago said, we're actually in favor of all the Jews moving to Israel. It'll make it easier to annihilate them. We won't have to chase them down around the rest of the world. So this is a central focus of their of their existence, not of their policy. It goes much, much deeper than that. So you subscribe to the, uh, the uh, conclusion of Bernard Lewis, the preeminent Oriental scholar Absolutely. in the West, who uh, scholar on Islam, who, who said that Iran was even willing, the, this Islamic regime, the Ayatollahs, they are willing to commit national suicide that let, let Iran be raised to the ground just so we destroy Israel. It's nuts. Yes. But, uh, and that, and that uh, mad, mutual assured destruction through some sort of nuclear exchange or whatever is more an invitation than a deterrence to them. 
Well, on one level, I, would, I agree with it. I, what I'm about to say may sound contradictory, but it's actually supplementary. Once they make the decision through a combination of psychology confirmation bias on the one hand and belief on the other, they're not going to go into it believing that they're going to be annihilated. Just as the Japanese didn't attack Pearl Harbor anticipating that they would be wiped out, just in, and I can give you, let, let's, let's say this, Virt, in virtually every war in history, at least one side made a mistake, thinking they were going to win. Yes. Okay. So, I, it, it, my point is that it doesn't necessarily have to be suicidal thinking, even if it, if it becomes suicidal outcome. Yeah. No, that's for, that's a good point, but they're willing, at least willing, and, yes. and I think the Ayatollah said it. Let her, let Iran be raised to the ground. We don't that's care, long, right? Yeah, you know, because he he feels that the Shiite movement that he you know has led the Shi that the, the Iranian Ayatollahs have have led since 1979 that they will lead the wider Muslim world to victory over the West. And all enemies, starting with the Jews, it's a sign from Allah. I think this Correct. is okay. All right, uh, this is some of the theology, ideology, but uh, we want to get into a little strategy here. And I think this is the the real um, burning question that I've had uh, over recent years. Hezbollah uh, triggered a five-week rocket war against Israel back in 2006. It was Israel's longest conflict at the time, longer than Yom Kippur War, any other of its wars, uh, and uh, very intense. But then the North has been relatively quiet, and the rocket war sort of, you know, it sort of, um, you know, enticed Hamas to start firing rockets. And they've had, we've had at least five major rocket wars with Hamas in Gaza, and some of them drug out for weeks and weeks. And you're wondering, I know all Israelis are wondering, all Christians out there who care about Israel wondering, are we going to have a two-front war? Is Hezbollah going to join this? Fire from the north, Hamas from the south in Gaza, overlapping range, and, and just put all of Israel under, under this barrage all at once. Why haven't we had that? Okay, first, first of all, let, let me modify what we're looking at into the future is not a two-front war, it's a four-front war. Add the Houthis of Yemen who can now fire into southern Israel. That was one of my questions. That's okay. interesting. Um, and add the Syrian front where there are already Iranian militias and the Iranians themselves are trying to establish themselves. So we have the Lebanese front, the Syrian front, the Hamas front, the Houthi front, and we can leave as a question mark today on Samaria and terrorism. And what about uh, also Iraq? They, they've just, uh, in the last day or so, introduced this Kaibar missile. I mean, right. that, that's really interesting. But front-wise, that would be the same as the Syrian front. Yes. Okay. okay. How many enemies we'll be facing is a whole different question. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how many different directions we're going to have to face, I would say a minimum of four and a likelihood of five. And, and possibly threats out in the sea, of course. coming out of Lebanon or Syria, especially to the no oil question. platforms. And, no question. Uh, and the Iranian Navy. Yeah. Prime Minister Bennett, Naftali Bennett, called it the ring of fire around yes. Israel the other day yes. when he talked about the laser systems Israel's developed. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, you, you asked why it's been quiet. And here... Uh, the answer is because the Iranians are thinking strategically. Their ultimate goal, or let's say their ultimate goal is to destroy Israel. Their ultimate strategy is based on getting nuclear weapons, which today, unfortunately, the West is not paying a lot of attention to. The Iranians have stated, and correctly in my opinion, that Israel is a one-bomb country, detonate one nuclear weapon over Tel Aviv, and Israel is finished, even if it's not wiped out that day, it's the end of the country. Who's going to invest in this country after that? How does, how does it maintain itself after that? Uh, it, it, it's clear. We know that they know that we know that they know. That is something that they want, 
and we cannot permit to happen. Mm. Hezbollah is being held as a deterrent reserve by Iran. In other words, even now, as we strike, and just the other night, we struck targets around Damascus, and they fight, the Syrians fired anti-aircraft missiles, one of which exploded somewhere, flew over Israel and exploded some, somewhere between uh, the area of Megiddo and, and the Mediterranean. Uh, but these are all pinprick strikes. They're, they're tactical successes. We've been, the Air Force has been very good at, at hitting its targets. But strategically, it's not succeeding in stopping them, it's slowing them down. So it's adding to their timetable, but it's not setting them back per se. One of the reasons that we don't strike harder is because of the, the Hezbollah rocket threat that, that you raised earlier, and, and it's certainly a serious one. But the Hezbollah is also being deterred. There's a cer certain mutuality here because we have stated, and they take this very seriously, that the next round with Hezbollah is going to be the last round. And Iran and Hezbollah both know that they don't want to waste this asset. They will use it. In other words, if necessary, they will burn it up in its proper use. But there's absolutely no reason for them to waste it now prematurely when they need it both A, as a deterrent for now, and as a retaliatory capability for the when, not if, we go after the Iranian nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. So that's all being kept quiet. So what are the Iranians doing? They're using Hamas as a proxy. Now here, no great secret. As I said before, Hezbollah is part of Iran. Hamas are Palestinians. The Iranians will happily fight to the last drop of Palestinian blood. They have no, there's no sentiment here. And they're Sunni Muslims too. And they're Sunnis, but don't, let's not overstate the Sunni Shiite issue. Okay. Right. It's there, but let's not overstate it. Iran is supporting the Taliban, which is Sunni. They're supporting Al Qaeda, which is Sunni, mm -hmm. Hamas, Islamic Jihad. There's a lot of Sunni support coming out of Iran, which wouldn't be there if the Sunni Shiite conflict were as dire as it's made out to be in the Western media. It's there, but again, let's not overstate it. Having said that, they don't care. In other words, if they can gain a bit from it, they don't care how many losses Hamas takes in the process. So we're going to see an increase, and we've seen it already, in Hamas activity. We're seeing more just yesterday, the day before, um, a couple of terrorists came out of Gaza and firebombed an Israeli truck. There was nobody in it, but they firebombed the truck and scooted back into Gaza. In other words, we're, we're, we're seeing escalation. We're seeing a, a further terrorist attacks in Judea and Samaria, um, not only by Hamas, because there's another aspect here that Iran knows, and that is that as Hamas escalates, Fatah has to stay in the game or be considered to be collaborators or wimps. Mm -hmm. So the three terrorists that we killed the other night were Tanzim, Fatah. Um, in other words, there, there, there's a whole escalation going on that Iran has instigated, but at no cost to itself. And they can use uh, Hamas to sort of test Israel's rocket defense systems this whole time. They can... A, use it to test Israel's defense system. They can also use it to dilute Israel's defense system mm. because we don't have yes. unlimited interceptors. That's right. That's right. And you can see uh, how easy it is to shut down Ben Gurion Airport, for instance, which yes. is, uh, uh, for them, it's a big tactical victory that they can tap. Sure. Yeah. Okay, but you know this this thing of of uh, Iran playing the long game, a long term strategy to, to use these these this ring of rockets around Israel as a deterrent, a, a constant deterrent against Israel attacking their nuclear facilities until they have nuclear weapons. They say that is it, the Iranians invented chess, and they're they're like chess players here. This is absolutely, um, you know, the checkmate comes from Shah Mat. The Shah is dead. 
<laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that means that what happened in 2006, I, I think the, there's a consensus that developed after that war that uh, Nasrallah, Sheikh Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, he wanted to have this border incident where he shot some soldiers, whether he killed them, wounded them, grab them, pull them back across the border for a prisoner exchange because he saw all the prisoners that the Palestinians were getting exchanged. He did not expect, he thought Israel was a spider web that wouldn't react. Israel responded forcefully and started a, a five week war. And he was actually in trouble with Tehran over that, correct? Yes, I mean, here, here I, I think it pays to, to go back a little bit to how he made that miscalculation. Okay, we pulled out of Lebanon in May 2000, and he saw that as a great victory, and correctly from, from his point of view. Shortly after, in the fall of 2000, what is commonly referred to as the Second Intifada, or which I call the, the terrorist war of 2000, began and escalated through 2001. This was the period of the suicide attacks, um, horrendous operations going on here. And when that all escalated, a decision was made, which I understand, I didn't agree with it, but you know, there are decisions that you can disagree with and still understand the rationale behind them. The decision was made to shift the weight of the IDF off the Northern border and into the center of the country where the larger population was and where terrorism was coming out of. I actually wrote a short article at the time called Ignoring the North, where I don't want to say that I anticipated what was going to happen, but there was anticipation of what was going to happen. Because once we stripped the northern border of its infantry capability, we lost the ability to respond to anything that Hezbollah was doing. And the result was that they were launching a stream of attacks starting already in the fall of 2000 with the killing and taking the bodies of the three soldiers on uh, Mount Dov on the Hermon, which we didn't respond to, to all sorts of attacks that included firing so-called anti-aircraft uh, munitions that landed in Israel and Nahariya and Shlomi and Ma'alot. Now, here I'll let you in on a military secret. Anti-aircraft munitions don't hit the ground. They explode in the air. So they weren't anti-aircraft munitions. I mean, an occasional one might fail, but these were not occasional. And they just happened to land in populated areas. We went along with the myth of it being anti-aircraft because if we said that it wasn't, we would have to go in and do something about it. So for essentially six years, we let them dictate the terms of the relationship on the northern border. And in 2006, for a whole bunch of reasons, in part, and here I, I can say, in part because of the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, which freed up infantry units, we were in a different position in the, in the summer of 06 than we ever had been before up in, from, from 2000. He didn't read, Nasrallah didn't read the map correctly, and I'm talking about the political strategic map, and we went after them. So... That was his error was in not understanding the change in situation, not in a total misunderstanding because he was operating as if we were still back in 02, 03, 04, whatever. And of course, he was greatly surprised. Yeah. The, also, the, add, yeah. No, go ahead. We inflicted a massive battlefield defeat on Hezbollah during that war. The Air Force performed brilliantly. The ground forces performed brilliantly. The high command performed horribly. But Hezbollah knew that where, wherever they faced us on the ground, we wiped the battlefield with. Mm. So the, the threat of the aftermath of the war in which there was a, a shakeup in the, in the upper echelons of the IDF, there was a change in thinking, a change in tactics, uh, a change in government, ultimately, brought Nasrallah and the Iranians to understand that the next time around, it's not going to look like the last time around. Mm -hmm. And here I should just add to, to conclude, one of the reasons it took five weeks is because on our side, 
there was no sense of urgency. As a matter of fact, one of the divisional commanders up north infamously said in an interview, we have all, all the time in the world. Now, that's not war, war thinking. That's insanity. By the way, he was relieved of his command. Uh, <laughs> So we're thinking very differently today. I can't go into details, obviously, because you know that's war planning and, and classified, but it's no secret. We're, we have no plans on dragging it out for five weeks with Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, look, I, it's, I think uh, you know, a lot of the people might not know a lot of the detail of the 2000 through 2005 Second Palestinian Intifada, where Israel basically had to reinvade the, the West Bank to put out uh, to wipe out the terror infrastructure the PLO had built up there, Hamas and Fatah. And uh, this took a lot of forces from the north, you said, 2006, Na Nasrallah tests it. And, uh, and he wound up getting his knuckles wrapped by Iran for pre you know, doing something that really it shows that, you know, who's really in control. It's Tehran. He, he, after the war in a TV interview, he stated explicitly that if he had known that that was going to be the Israeli response, he never would have launched the attack in the first place. Yeah. And he used some of this huge arsenal that is really meant as a deterrence right now to help Iran uh, successfully build a nuclear weapon. And then they can use the rockets whenever they want. Yes. Once you have that sort of capability. You know, at the time coming out of that war, Hezbollah there were opinion polls throughout the Middle East. They were the most popular uh, leader. Nasrallah was the most popular leader. Hezbollah was the most popular thing in the whole Middle East, except for maybe Amr Musa, the Egyptian diplomat. You know, I hate Israel. Uh, I love Amr Musa. That song that came out, it was all about the right. same time. And But now they are very despised, especially in the Sunni Arab world, but in Saudi Arabia, the Arab Emirates, Egypt and all, because of what they've done to, to Lebanon and the way they've uh, helped prop up the Assad regime, correct? They're really, yes, yes. they've fallen mightily. Um, they, have, they have fallen mightily. Um, a few things are going on. One is that the Arab countries, the Emirates in particular, said the Saudis are terrified of the Iranians. And all of a sudden, when your, your life and your regime are threatened, um, all sorts of old ideologies like we hate Israel fall to the wayside. And here I can add that Europe and the United States are not seen as reliable allies anymore. And Israel is seen by them, and I'm talking about the Emirates and the Saudis and, and, and like that, and even the Egyptians, as a country that can switch sides on Iran. In other words, here, here we're talking about a fixed, constant, and they like that. Countries like certainty, leaders like certainty. So that's one thing. Uh, second, Hezbollah has in fact been in large part uh, a contributor to the destruction of Lebanon. And here again, for those countries, instability is not good. Look what happened in the so-called Arab Spring. One Tunisian pours a flammable fluid on himself and lights himself up. And the next thing you know, there are insurrections all through the Arab world. And I'm not commenting on good, bad, right, wrong, but from the leader, from the point of view of a leader in the Arab world, that's the last thing they want right now. So in both of those cases, Israel is seen as, as the sort of the bulwark and Iran and Hezbollah are seen as the troublemakers. And that, that, that's a large component of the diplomatic shifts that we're seeing in the Arab world today. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I think it's very important that, uh, especially America, to stand up uh, with its allies, uh, going back to especially the Obama administration, just so uh, bent, bending over to do some deal with Iran and turning its back, not only in Israel, some of these Sunni Arab states, it's been very important. I, I want to ask a little about Lebanon, that since that 2006 war, 
uh, Hezbollah has been rearmed, even though there was a Security Council resolution that no one could rearm them. They've grown that rocket arsenal, I think you said, from around 20,000 rockets 15 years ago to now 250,000. Yes. And, uh, and, and yet, if the West tries to do anything, uh, uh, Lebanon's in economic freefall. It's under the grip of Iran, uh, uh, of Hezbollah, which is siphoning off every resource in its battle against Israel and to help uh, in the Syrian civil war. And what can the West do to loosen Hezbollah's grip on Iran? Isn't it all just going to get uh, cre- skimmed off again for for by Hezbollah? Look, as long as long as Hezbollah remains a powerful player, there's no diplomatic or economic way to remove them. Uh, they, they're very clever. By the way, as, as are organizations like Hamas, the destruction of the Lebanese economy works to the benefit of organizations like Hezbollah, which is now providing services that the government can't provide. Mm. Hamas started doing that in Gaza back in, well, it started doing it way back in, in the, the 70s and even earlier, before, before it was even Hamas. Uh, Hezbollah runs hospitals, it runs schools, mm-hmm. it runs daycare centers, etc. And, and think of, of the gamut of social services that a government would normally provide. Uh, Hezbollah now provides a major portion of that in Lebanon. What that means is you don't want to run afoul of them because not because of threats of violence, but if you need to go to the hospital and they know you're not part of, you know, you're one of the opposition, they'll turn you away. And immediate needs are far more important for the most part. So as long as they remain there, they are going to be a, a powerful factor in Lebanese politics. The old games of politics, pressure, sanctions are simply not going to work against them. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that from where I see it, um, the only way we're going to get rid of them ultimately is by going in and cleaning them out. Mm-hmm. And uh, shifting the focus over into uh, Syria, how effective has the IDF been in trying to, uh, you know, uh, weaken the Iranian Revolutionary Guard presence there, and also Hezbollah there, and especially trying to ship weapons through Syria into Lebanon to get into Hezbollah's hands. Well, to expand on something I said earlier, tactically, we've been outstanding. In other words, the the strikes that we're doing are extremely effective as such. In other words, the Air Force is being given targets. And it's not only the Air Force, but let's talk only about the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force is being given targets. The Air Force is taking out those targets as ordered. It's not suffering losses. And in, in this entire campaign, we lost one aircraft over the past, I don't know, five or six years. Um, and, and that actually ended up crashing in Israel. The, the pilot and, and weapons officer got out I mean, ejected. Mm-hmm. So the overall cost of the campaign from an Israeli perspective has been minimal, and it has certainly taken out huge quantities of munitions, materiel, that is supposed to A, go to Hezbollah, and B, part of the establishment of Iranian Revolution, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps um, operatives in Syria. Having said all of that, strategically, it's not working. In other words, we're not taking out all of it. We're, take, we're always taking out a portion of it, and they're adding more to the portion. So the, the overall volume is increasing, and we can't keep up with it. There's no way w- that we can. Uh, Iran and through Iraq have direct land contact ability, plus the ability to fly things directly into Damascus. It's no secret that they use civilian airliners for that. We're not going to shoot down civilian airliners in order to stop it. So it's always going to be a um, an ultimately losing proposition. 
these are probably guided rockets, more advanced, uh, longer range, and, and guided rockets that give them ability to or, really hone more in guidance, on the target. Or guidance systems for the existing rockets. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. here, here I think. You I, turn I a think dumb bomb into a smart bomb with a little. Well, bomb. let's say turn a dumb bomb into a less dumb bomb. Yes. Okay. okay. Because yeah, last here, time you talked about how it's not quite the cutting edge guidance right, because, systems. That because it doesn't have to be. Here, here also, let's, let's understand the difference in mentality. One of the reasons that we want to use highly precision munitions when we go after Hamas, for example, is because we don't want to miss and hit civilians. So we'll fire one missile that is highly precise and not only that, have an, an additional manual guidance system so that if non-combatants show up in the target area while the missile is in flight it can be diverted and we, we do that mm -hmm. very often mm -hmm. but what, what that means basically is an error area that's measured in inches hezbollah has absolutely no interest in that they're perfectly happy to fire 100 150 200 rockets at a time into a populated area all they need in terms of precision is to make sure the rockets land in the city. They're not aiming at a specific target like a building. Uh, we call these statistical weapons. In other words, if you drop 100 rockets into a, 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 an urban area, some of them are going to hit buildings just by the randomness. Their guidance improvement, I, didn't, I don't even call, want to call it precision, their guidance improvement is to guarantee that the majority of rockets they fire actually land in an urban area rather than out in open fields or, or in the ocean or wherever. So I, it, it's important with, to, to understand we're not talking about precision guidance. We're talking about simply bringing the error factor in to be good enough to hit a city. They're just trying to get on the green. Basically. Basically, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, look, uh, you, you said there's certain uh, disadvantages for Israel against Hamas in Gaza with all the population. If you're talking about Israeli operations in Syria, you also have the, the limitation of the Russian presence there. You don't want to hit any Russians. No. And, that, and especially all these recent attacks in Latakia, which is a, a main port uh, a Syrian port that where Russia has naval vessels, there's Russian air defenses and maybe even Russian pilots in the yes. air, and yet Israel's still getting around them. What were they targeting there in Latakia when Israel struck, uh, I think, even in the port? Look, there, in, in Latakia, there are a few things. First of all, there are warehouses. Um, things are being brought in by sea, and we're, we're tracking lots of stuff. Here, I, I don't think I need to elaborate on Israeli intelligence and its capabilities. The Iranians have a presence, a naval presence in Latakia. Uh, so hitting them, not their ships necessarily, but their logistics, their, their warehouses also has a value. Uh, the Russians up until now have been willing to coordinate with us to make sure that we don't accidentally get in each other's way. And they shifted on that recently, a few weeks ago. But it seems to me, and I don't know this for sure, but it seems to me that with everything going on now with Ukraine, the Russians are backing off a little bit here in the Middle East. There, there's a limit to how many parties they can dance at at the same time also. Mm -hmm. Even for their own public. Their own public is all sensitive to right. foreign interventions. Uh, after Afghanistan. Um, look, uh, um, we, we started uh, getting into um, these attack drones and, and guided missiles or ballistic missiles that the Houthis have, and they've been even using them in recent weeks on the United Arab Emirates. And you say they now have the capability from all the way down in Yemen the whole Arabian Peninsula, they can shoot and attack from there, probably a lot in the southern Negev? That seems to be the case. Um, they haven't done it yet, so we can't say with certainty. But given their ability to strike as they have, 
it's not out of, and, and, and by the way, and, and they've stated openly that that's their objective to be able to hit a lot and, and the Southern Negev. Uh, if they don't have the capability today, they're not far from it. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I know the attack on the, um, the Saudi oil field installations, it was very coordinated. You had yes. uh, like a dozen or two dozen attack drones that can come in, they can hover, and, and when the guided missiles are coming in, they can also all attack at the same time. And yes. it was very complex, coordinated, and a lot of damage. Yes. So, and we face that from Western Iraq and Syria. I know Absolutely. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard at a certain air base in Syria has tried to launch drones into Northern Israel through the Yarmouk Valley towards Beit Shean. Yes, and, and a couple of them have gotten into Israel, although they've all been, been shot down. Yeah, uh, they're able to it, track them. That gives you confidence. Right. You can Look, see them coming. Any, any time a new weapon or a new technology appears on the battlefield, there's always going to be a bit of a lag in developing methods to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Even if the technology to deal with it exists, its application is going to take time. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we've reduced that time to ridiculously short. In other words, historically, usually you don't, you don't end up with, with responses this quickly, mm -hmm. but we have. Uh, it doesn't mean 100% success, and I think that's, that's also important. People who think that, uh, you, you, that warfare ends in shutouts, it never does. Mm -hmm. But if it seems to be the case that we're in the direction of being able to reduce it to what would be a manageable threat for warfare circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it's it's against your civilian heartland, and it well, takes uh, perseverance, patience, endurance by the whole all the people to sure. to survive this. Yeah, look, uh, while we're talking here, we just want to encourage those who are in, in registered for Envision. If you have a, a question that you want to ask uh, Major Elliot Hadoff of the IDF Reserves that we've been speaking to here, we're really glad to have him. If you have some question, if you can uh, get it to us, someone who's probably watching on the streaming, the Envision streaming platform needs to somehow get me these questions uh, and, and we'll try and take them. But uh, let's continue our con conversation now. When you talk about Israel's capabilities in dealing with this threat, we've talked enough about how dire, how serious the threat is. How, what are Israel's capabilities? Uh, I understand the Patriot was fired. The Patriot III was fired at these rockets coming in from Yemen into United Arab Emirates. But it was the UAE. They had something that helped you know, take some of them down. Israel has the Iron Dome, the David Sling, the Arrow 3. The yes. Iron Dome's proved itself, but it's also these things are expensive and you're going to get depleted stocks of all your interceptor missiles within a few days if you're getting five, ten, uh, you know, uh, two, three thousand rockets a day, which is what you expect. First of all, um, yes to everything you just said. I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago that I'll, I'll, I'll simply paraphrase here. And that is that if the entire strategy is based on defense, you will ultimately lose. Because, yes. and, and this is true in, in, in anything, even, even if you're, the, the system is superb and I, I consider the Iron Dome to be semi-miraculous in terms of technology, and I'm a low tech guy. If I say that it's, it's, it's really extraordinary, uh, but it has its, its limitations. It has quantity limitations. It has longevity, stamina limitations. As, as you mentioned, eventually you use them up. Uh, there's a limit to how many can be fired at any given time. It's, if you just take the public numbers and, I'm, and, and it's, it, it's sufficient for our purposes, Every interceptor rocket costs somewhere between $60,000 and $75,000. Every Katyusha rocket costs about $600. You don't need to have a Nobel Prize in economics to figure out that this is a losing strategy over the long run. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, in the short run, it's critical. That's how you, you protect your population. But if all we're going to do is knock the stuff out of the sky, we will ultimately lose. Mm. So the, the begged for answer, and I, I alluded to it, I'll, I'll say it explicitly. In Lebanon, it means a ground invasion and cleaning them out. From further away, it means airstrikes or missile strikes or some, some, some combination, perhaps special forces operations and that sort of thing. Uh, but ultimately, it, me it means destroying them in their homes. I don't talk about the missiles and, and drones and, and, and all of those and the rockets, uh, and not simply sitting on this side trying to pick them out of the sky. If we're talking about a dozen being fired out of Gaza, we can, we can handle that. In other words, it doesn't require what I just said. If we're talking about 2,000 a day out of Lebanon, an additional God knows how many, because they haven't really shown their full capability of drones and other rockets coming out of Syria, Iraq, and other places, um, then we're talking about having to go on the offensive in order to put an end to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Bennett made a, a big deal, a, a splash, let's say, uh, about a week ago, where he made some public announcement that within a year, Israel is going to be able to de finish developing and deploy a laser system that can take down some of these uh, rockets. I mean, uh, is this, uh, and, but there were some uh, analysis pieces that said, this this was um, not uh, you know I, I don't know if you've got something else going on. We need to. Okay, we can hear you. Okay, we're talking about the the laser systems. I know they they've developed some lasers that are shooting down balloons coming yes. from. Gaza border. It's helping with that little, you know, conflict along the border where they're trying to always start fires. Uh, but there's different kinds of laser systems. Can you tell yeah. us how this might fit into Israel's future defense? How soon are they going to be deployed? First of all, they're they're in the process of doing test deployments. It's not clear how effective they will be, although there are great hopes. Um, how effective they're going to be over the long term against multiple layer threats. I would be, I mentioned before that I'm low tech. So here, here I would be cautious about a pure technological solution simply because technology is always, has always been overcome by new technology. Mm. And I'll add something maybe slightly heretical in, in, in the, modern age of technology, as high tech gets higher and higher, its half-life gets shorter and shorter. Yes. Things are developed and deployed a lot faster. That's right. Exactly. These days. But there, there's these energy pulses that can go up and destroy a rocket, and you could even destroy planes that can be anti-aircraft and, yes, and but, such. But let, let, me, let me just give you a, a, an analogy. When radar was developed, it was the last word in air defense. Yes. And when radar guided missiles were developed, they were the last, last word mm -hmm. in air defense. Until somebody designed a missile that can, can home in on the radar mm -hmm. and take out the radar base mm -hmm. using the same beam that the radar was using to track the targets. Mm -hmm. In other words, Nothing is static. People aren't sitting and saying, oh, there's a new technology. Let's go home and, and, and go back to school and become accountants. Mm -hmm. they're, they're sitting working on countermeasures. The countermeasures can be higher technology. They can be lower technology. The way Hamas is defeating or, or contending with Iron Dome today is by firing more rockets. Okay, in other words, a purely mm -hmm. blunt yeah. edge quantitative response to the highest tech anti-rocket technology in the world. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think it's important. Yes, you always have to you know, move ahead and stay ahead of your adversary, but it's not, it is an answer. It's not the answer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know that, uh, you know, the Iron Dome has been something of a miracle and, and really helping on the home front, giving people resilience uh, to face it. I think, you know, a good laser system developed that it's cheaper than Iron Dome to shoot down rockets, kill rockets. But uh, like you say, that uh, there'll be some counter to it at some point. But uh, I, I know uh, uh, Iran does a lot of boasting on its capabilities. We've got, uh, you know, a ship to shore missile or ship to ship that can do this and this. And it turns out it's some 30 years old that uh, is old footage or whatever. So right. Sometimes get that. They can't quite keep up, but they're going to rely on, on Russia or someone else to help them. Also keep in mind that these countries don't need absolute success in the way that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, talking about the Iranians, they don't need super sophisticated weapons, but if they put, I, we talked about Tel Aviv being a, you know, a one bomb or Israel yeah, being a one bomb country. Uh, an American aircraft carrier getting hit by a few ballistic missiles is not in good shape. Mm -hmm. And we know that they're, that, that they're aiming for that. Can mm -hmm. they flood the zone with enough of their mediocre technology to overcome the high technology of an American carrier task force? I don't have the answer, but I know that they want to do it. Yeah, they want to try at least, yeah. Okay, we have a question from a pastor, uh, Pastor Paul in India. That, uh, but I think it's basically what we've been talking about with the recent attitude by the U.S. towards supporting Israel and supplying Iron Dome, et cetera. What are the alternative solutions? Uh, and you know, besides maybe developing a laser system, you know, I want to divide out this rocket threat from the nuclear threat. We want to end on talking about the nuclear threat, but what else can Israel do with it about this rocket threat? As I said, not, not much. Ultimately, we're going to have to eliminate it at its source. Which means ground invasion. And, and cleaning it out. Absolutely. The at Air least Force, all the way to Beirut again. Possibly beyond. I, mm -hmm. I, you know what? Churchill famously said, everybody knows how to start a war. Nobody knows how to end one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I won't, I'm not going to predict where it ends. Mm. Uh, but I will say that even if the Air Force does the amazing equivalent of the job that it did in 06, where it took out over half of the rocket capability in the first 72 hours, mm -hmm. half of 250,000 still leaves them with 125,000 rockets. Uh -huh. Yeah. We're talking about rockets that are easy to hide. They're easy to disperse. They don't require huge infrastructure. They're not artillery. They're fire and walk away, which means ultimately the way to stop them is that you have to go in and find them. Yeah. And Hamas, uh, I think Hezbollah has learned uh, a lot from Hamas about how to hide your rockets. And Israel's given even the UN maps of where all the munitions, all the rockets are hidden all through Lebanon. Uh, so they have targets, but they can move them. There's underground tunnels and everything. Also, the UN, the UN isn't interested in going after them. Uh, you know, the UN's job is, is to make note of what's going on and report. Mm. Uh, not to intervene mm. and we learned a long time ago in the 1950s and 1960s not to rely on the UN mm. so putting them in there was cosmetic anybody who believed that they were actually going to prevent the rearming of, of Hezbollah and their rebuilding of their, their military infrastructure um, no, had, had no basis in reality. Okay, we want to um, uh, take our last few minutes focusing on the Iranian nuclear program. I think I have sort of three questions. How close do you think they are to uh, nuclear capability? Uh, how effective have the covert operations been? 
in uh, doing damage to their nuclear infrastructure? And does Israel have the abilities to, to launch, carry out a successful uh, attack against the Iranian uh, nuclear program? I think there's been uh, Ehud Barak, former prime minister, former IDF chief of staff, wrote some article back in September that said it, because of the corona, the no government, no state budgets, Israel fell behind in, in a couple of the components. You need the planes capable, F-35s, they have them now, stealth aircraft. You need uh, refueling planes. Israel probably needs an upgrade on those. And you need a, a big latest grade bunker busters and they need those from the U.S. Can you, uh, those are three questions. Okay, First, so yeah. Um, let me start with the third one because I, I, I wanna relate to, some, to what Barack said. I, I don't know what he's thinking. Um, but he's simply wrong. To Good. state to state unequivocally that these are the criteria, and without these you can't do something, is a military fallacy that has only caused people who think that trouble historically. Hmm. And I, I, I want to give you a, a, a very quick American example because it's it, it, it's so illustrative. At Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States fleet did not deploy torpedo nets to protect its ships because it was common knowledge that aerial torpedoes could not operate in the water, the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Hmm. The Japanese came up with a very simple solution. They put large plywood horizontal fins on their torpedoes to prevent them from diving to the depth of the bottom of Pearl Harbor and they sank a whole bunch of American battleships thanks to that error. Mm. So never say never. I can give you a whole lecture on, on similar cases. There are many, many ways of solving one problem and, you, and the, the idea that your requirements are A, B, and C, and without these, the problem can't be solved is a fallacy. It just means you can't solve it the way you thought you might be able to solve it. That's called thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. So Israel has capabilities, it has many capabilities, um, not the capabilities that the United States has, but certainly we've shown over the decades that we can come up with all sorts of creative solutions to insoluble problems. The first two questions you asked are actually connected to each other. How close are they and how effective have countermeasures been? The answer is the countermeasures, cyber and otherwise, have been effective. But just like our airstrikes in Syria, they've been effective in slowing them down, not really in setting them back, right? Because whatever has been gained is gained. Now, there's been damage to all sorts of things and maybe setting them back in, in terms of quantity, but their qualitative advancement continues slower than it would have been. So they are certainly closer today than they were last year and five years ago and 10 years ago and so on. I will not predict when or how close because any prediction of that, of that type suffers from what I call Prophet Jonah syndrome. After all, when, when Jonah prophesied the destruction of Nineveh, was the prophecy correct? It was. But built into the prophecy was an unwritten line that's built into every intelligence projection, unless somebody does something about it. Mm -hmm. Repent. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Or, or, or we will impose cyber repentance. Yeah. Uh, my point is that obviously there are people working very, very hard to push that date as far down the road as we possibly can. And any projection that says that they're going to have this capability in a month or two months or three months is not taking those things into account. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. going to say that it's possible that they're only a couple of months away, but there are a lot of pe people working 24-7 to keep pushing that down the road uh, for as long as we possibly can. Okay. I, it's good that you brought up uh, the book of Jonah in the Bible because we've got 
several questions here that are sort of uh, in a, more of a spiritual nature. And I, I do think we're talking about a serious subject here, a serious threat, both the rocket threat, the Iranian nuclear threat. But uh, I just want to encourage everyone, first of all, we need to be praying about all of these things we've been discussing here. But I believe when you read the word of God, God has not brought back the Jewish people for some uh, last finals day annihilation back in the land, but for redemption. This is the sure promise of God. Uh, the, I think it was uh, Nasrallah who, or one of the uh, Hezbollah clerics who said, you know, maybe Allah has gathered the Jews back so it makes it easier for us to wipe them out all in one place. A very diabolical thought, but, you know, that's their thinking. But I believe it's the hand of God that has restored Israel. The question is, are we going to stand here and help fight that spiritual battle? I hope everyone's up for it. And how, the question really is, how is God going to deliver this nation from this threat that he's sovereign, he's allowed it to build up, and sometimes God allows these things to build up in order to have even an even mightier deliverance, that he, what he did to Egypt and what he's done to other kingdoms who ha have tried to endanger or wipe out the Jewish people, the, the nation of Israel, they paid a price. We, we actually should be praying for the Iranian people who are under the hand of this really radical Islamic regime. And we do pray for them, and especially the body of Christ there. We have been so honored and privileged to have IDF major reserves Elliot Hadoff with us both last week up on in Miskabam on the border and now for a whole hour today. I'm sure we're going to uh, call on you again. It's been so informative, so enriching, so up to date, so, uh, uh, you know, good, solid information for all of us. We really, really appreciate it, Elliot. My pleasure. Anytime. Okay. All right, that's the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, this evening, we have our uh, main uh, keynote service, uh, and uh, I believe Peter Sukahira is going to be delivering the keynote message in that. We'll have worship, we'll have conversation with other guests. There's an hour, a uh, whole hour program that starts at eight o'clock. Uh, Israel time, Jerusalem time. And uh, if you're part of Envision, you can watch it on the streaming platform. Uh, but if you're not there yet, you can go and register at Envision, on.icej.org slash Envision 2022 and register all the content, even over the last three weeks and all of next week's is going to be available as a view on demand all the way to the end of April. So it's only $20 to join Envision. We've had fantastic Fantastic speakers, fantastic content, and uh, Elliot Chadoff has been uh, among the cream de la creme. So thank you again, Elliot. Shalom from Jerusalem. God bless you.